17, beginning with verse 11. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save the stranger. And he said unto them, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Wow. We have before us here an incident that took place shortly before Jesus returned to Jerusalem to face Calvary's cross. And this incident involved ten lepers. Notice first, if you will, the fact that Jesus reached out to the outcasts of society. The birth of the Savior was not announced to kings or queens or dignitaries, but to shepherds abiding in their field. Shepherds were considered outcasts because they didn't attend the synagogue and, and rarely mingled with the people of the city because they couldn't leave their flocks. And it was to this lonely, forsaken group that the Savior's birth was announced. I find that significant. The Son of God left heaven's throne and He could have announced His arrival to kings and queens and princes. But He announced it to those shepherds. And when Jesus announced His calling as the Messiah in the synagogue of Nazareth where He grew up, He was handed the scroll of Isaiah and declared that, he was, that it was to the downshot, to the dregs of society, to the outcasts of the world that it was come. Luke 4.18 the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. I can guarantee you can find yourself in any one of those categories. Those are the people Jesus came to help, to reach, to show the light of salvation. As Jesus began his public ministry, he was greatly criticized by the Pharisees because he broke bread with harlots, publicans who were tax collectors hated by everyone, and sinners. And we see this in Matthew chapter 9. Let's take a look at it. Matthew chapter 9. It's hard to believe that we are told Jesus went about doing good and they hated him for it. Here's one of those examples. Matthew 9, 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of customs, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now notice then what he says. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. It's interesting and significant that Jesus rebukes the Pharisees with that statement. Go and find out what that means. The Pharisees were highly educated. They prided themselves on their intellect. But here Jesus is literally telling them, you don't know as much as you think you know. Go and find out what I'm trying to tell you. And when you do, then I'll give you an answer. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Pharisees were intelligent. They were educated. But their hearts were cold when it came to having compassion for others. Jesus knew these people were sinners. He knew they had their problems. And he knew that they were the outcasts of society. But he also knew that their only hope was salvation. Amen? Amen? And that's why he was reaching out to them. The irony of the hardness of heart the Pharisees showed is clearly seen in the incident concerning the woman of the city. I preached on it a few months ago that this woman was actually the daughter of this Pharisee. Uh, Mark chapter 
14. Let's take a look at it. I'm just laying the groundwork here. Mark chapter 14. Beginning with verse 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at me, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenar, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and had been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. All right. In a parallel passage, we are told that Simon the leper, who was also a Pharisee. So the indication is that he still had this leprosy. Now that's interesting because Jesus healed everybody he came in contact with. But this leper, Simon the Pharisee, was not healed. Why was that? Was it because of his unbelief? Not only did he not believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah, but he had doubts as to whether Jesus was a prophet. He said in his own mind, if this man were a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this was. Well, Jesus did know. And he didn't have a problem with it. This Pharisee, who was a leper, had the opportunity to be healed physically, and he had the opportunity to be healed spiritually. I mean, think of it. The Son of God was in this man's home. He was looking God right in the eyes and didn't realize, didn't even recognize the fact that he was and is the promised Messiah. All he could do was judge the fact that this woman had no business being in the house. She wasn't invited in the house. And if Jesus had any sense, he wouldn't even let this woman come anywhere near him. So the irony is that if anyone should have had compassion on this heart, this outcast of a woman, it should have been Simon the leper. But instead, he showed nothing but disdain. And this gives us insight into what Jesus was dealing with concerning the Pharisees. They were spiritually blind to the truth. And Jesus said, you're like dead men's bones on the inside. Dead here. The Lord Jesus was no respecter of persons. He treated Pharisees and lepers the same way. He had compassion on them all. Boy, that's a good guideline right there. Jesus gave that parable that when somebody comes in with deep pockets, he's given the best place to sit, and he's treated like he's a, somebody special. But what Jesus is trying to show us, we got to love everybody, see everybody through the eyes of God. And when we start doing that, we won't be going on outward appearances. We'll be seeing as God sees. For God looketh not on the outward appearance. God looketh on the heart. Jesus reached out to the outcast of society, which brings us to our opening passage of Scripture. In Luke 17, 11, it states, And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Now, when you want to talk about outcasts, the Samaritans were considered outcasts of society. They weren't treated much better than lepers. Why? Because the Samaritans, they were, they were considered half-breeds. The Jews would mock them and call them mongrels because they were half Jew and half Gentile and Jews would have nothing to do with them. In fact, rather than pass through Samaria, which was the quickest and most direct way to get to Jerusalem, they would take the long way around because they didn't even want to set foot in Samaria. I mean, think about that. That's pretty, pretty bad when you won't even take the shortcut to get to where you want to go because you don't want to even come in any area of it. That's why when Jesus was, was witnessing to that woman at the well who was a Samaritan, it blew the disciples' minds that he was talking to a woman which was not done then. And this woman was a woman of the city, which was the second thing. And the fact that she was a Samaritan, they just didn't get it. But again, it shows us that Jesus had no problem with people. He just loved people where they were at. While passing through Samaria, Jesus entered into a certain village and was met there by ten lepers. Now this village had to be a leper colony. It had to be. Because ten lepers would not be welcomed in any town or city. The practice of quarantining lepers is still practiced today. So, he was passing through the midst of a leper colony. Having looked at Jesus reaching out to the outcasts of society, Notice, secondly, the healing power of God. Verse 13. 
get there. Luke chapter 17 and verse 13. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Here in verse 13 is a picture or an illustration of our lives without God. Note the following. Leprosy is a picture of sin. Those with leprosy were considered unclean. And sin will cause you to think bad thoughts and act in a filthy way. That's what sin will do. Before we came to know God, we were all in the muck and mire of sin. Just floundering in the cesspool of life. Until God lifted us up out of that muck and mire and set our feet upon the rock. Hallelujah. Rather than live holy, pure lives, sin will drag you down back into that filth of the world. So leprosy is a picture of sin. And secondly, leprosy progressively destroys the nerve endings in the body, causing the individual to lose feeling in his limbs. People's fingers would fall off. They would have a cigarette and not realize that cigarette had burned down to the stubs of their fingers. They would cut their finger and not even feel it because leprosy would cause the nerve endings to die. And then eventually the parts of the body would start falling off. Got me to thinking about this. So also with sin. The deeper you get into some sinful habit, the harder your heart will become. When you first start slipping away, God convicts you. And you're under conviction about it. But after a while, you can be knee deep into some sin and not even blink an eye about it. That's what happens. We become desensitized to sin. And that's a bad place to be. You lose sight of what's right and what's wrong. The Bible speaks of those whose conscience has been seared with a hot iron. And that's exactly what happens. Our conscience becomes seared. You read stories about these kids who will abort a baby and then go to their prom, have pizza and not even think about it. You read about stories of people shooting someone and then going out there and having a good time with the money they took off this guy's body and not blinking an eye, not being troubled in any way. That's what it's talking about when it says your conscience can be seared. It's with a hot iron. You don't want to get that far from God. You don't want to get that desensitized to sin where a sledgehammer wouldn't get through to you. Number three. Leprosy will deform and disfigure an individual as the deep disease progresses. And so also sin. You look at pictures of sweet, innocent little kids. Then maybe fast forward 10, 20, 30 years. And see how sin has ravaged them. How it's wrecked their lives. Every once in a while, the newspaper will have a mugshot of somebody. When they got locked up for the first time as young kids. And fast forward 10 or 20 years after they've been ravaged by drugs. And you're looking at these pictures and saying, I can't be. How could that possibly be? Because sin will ravage you. There was a story about Leonardo da Vinci when he was painting the Last Supper. That he wanted someone to pose for Jesus. So he found this young fellow. Had this innocent face, this fresh face. And used this person for his model for Jesus. Then as he went through and did the other apostles. He needed to find someone that would represent Judas. Someone who was dark. Someone who was sinister. <laughs> Someone who, who reeked of evil. And he found this fellow that had a pose as Judas as he painted. And the guy said, you remember me? And he goes, no, should I? He goes, I'm the young man that posed for you when you did the picture of Jesus. And he looked at this fellow and he said, there's no way. He goes, yeah, it's me. This guy had turned sinister, had gotten dark over the years. By the time he came to be painted by Leonardo da Vinci, it was almost unrecognizable how sin had ravaged his life. And that's what it'll do. We need to recognize that fact that sin will take it to dark places. Number four, leprosy was contagious and it affected others. So also sin. So often the sins of the father are passed down to the children. Families are often destroyed because of some sinful habit. There ever comes a day when the father says, I'm not going to church anymore. Not only is it a tragedy concerning his life, but the downward effect is it will affect his family also. Maybe you've got a good testimony at work. You stop living for God. There's people watching your lives. Your co-workers. Your extended family. Your neighbors. They're watching your life. You stop living for God. Not only will it affect you. But it will have a terrible effect on those you're trying to reach with the gospel. <clears throat> 
sin will keep you from God. In verse 12, we are told that those ten lepers stood afar off. Sin will keep you from God. When we were lost and our lives were in darkness, we also were far off from God. Oh, I like that Ephesians chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Sin will keep you from God. It will come between you and God. That's where we all find ourselves when we're lost and walking in darkness. But God reaches out to us and loves us unconditionally. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Amen. And then the Holy Spirit draws us to God. We might go kicking and kicking and screaming initially. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to have nothing to do with Christians. But the Holy Spirit will keep drawing you with the love of God. John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draws him. John 12, 32. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. And God is continually drawing us. Even when we backslide, it's God drawing us back to that straight and narrow path. It's God helping us to get back on track and get our lives turned around. That's what he does. Notice what those lepers do. They lift up their voices. Verse 13. And that is the essence of prayer. You don't got to be a, a fancy prayer when it comes to praying. Just lift up your voice. You needed help. Maybe you were drowning in the water. You wouldn't be praying, Dear God, God of Jehoshaphat, God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and, uh, and Abraham, uh, uh, help me, I'm drowning. No, you'd say, Help save me. That's all you got to do. It's crying out to God. That's exactly what those lepers do. Whether it be delivered from some sinful habit, whether your life is a mess, cry out to God. Cry out to God. God's not interested in the words. He's interested in the intents of your heart. And then they acknowledged Jesus. Verse 13. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. This is important. To come to God, we must first know Jesus. There ain't no other way around it. Amen. There's a lot of people with head knowledge of God. they got a head knowledge of God, but that's not enough. The devils also believe and tremble, and they ain't getting to heaven. It takes more than just recognizing that Jesus was a historical figure, that Jesus was a real person. Even acknowledging that He was the Son of God, it's not enough. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So to get to God, you've got to go through the Son. Acts 4, 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. They acknowledged Jesus, and then they called upon Him. Verse 13, they said, Jesus, have mercy on us. And friends, that is the essence of what it takes for salvation. Those are three essential things that must take place for someone to get saved. There's one more thing that we'll look at in a moment's time, but that's going in the right direction right there. Acknowledging Jesus, calling upon Him. And then we see the healing power of God in verse 14. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. We read here Jesus healing all ten of those lepers. And it seems like it was a gradual process that as they started walking, their legs got better, their arms got better, their chest got better, their head got better. And as they're walking along, they're seeing the healing process. And again, that's just a picture of our lives. The moment we get saved, all our sins are forgiven. But then the restoration begins. And it might not happen overnight. The deeper you're into sin, the longer it might take for you to get completely healed. Maybe your mind's in a dark place. The healing process begins the moment you ask Him into your heart. Maybe your body's been ravaged by sin. The moment you give your life to God, the healing process begins. Amen. Amen. And then we're a work in progress till God calls us home. What about that? I mean, that's what we're told in 
Philippians 1 6 that were works in progress. Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Until the day Jesus returns, we're a work in progress. I like that song, He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. That's true. Jesus tells them to show themselves to the priests according to Leviticus chapter 14 to confirm that they are healed and clean. And it's interesting to note that this is the only time that Jesus healed a multitude, a multiple people at one time. Every other time it was a one-time thing. God did something significant here. He healed ten people at one time. And that's significant. Having looked at the healing power of God, notice, where are the nine? Verse 15 to 19. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. So the indication is that the other nine were Jews because it significantly mentions that this fellow was a Samaritan. Jesus heals ten lepers and after being healed, they all take off a running. But one of them turns back and falls on his face giving glory to God, giving thanks to God. Jesus then asks a question for effect because he's God. He already knew the answer. He says, were there not ten cleansed? Where's the other nine? Jesus seems to marvel that only one of the ten turned back to thank God. He has the same kind of attitude when he returned to his hometown of Nazareth. And we are told that he did not do many mighty miracles there, save he laid his hand on a few folk, and he marveled because of their unbelief. You know it's something significant when Jesus marvels, because God knows everything, but even their reaction took God back. He marveled at their unbelief, and he's marveling here that he healed ten people and only one of them turned back. He's marveling about that fact. Got me thinking about this. The same thing is happening today. Christians pray about some need that they have, some problem they're going through, some trial they're facing. God answers their prayer in a mighty way, and so many don't even take the time to offer up. Thanks, Lord. Praise you, Lord. They're already waving their next prayer request. Lord, when you get a chance, here's, a, here's another one, Lord. And God becomes like this magic lamp that we rub when we want something. And yet we don't have enough sense to take the time thank you. to thank Him for what we got to be thankful for. That can't be very pleasing to God. And the bottom line is, it's just flat out not right. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always. For all things under God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks in all things. First yes. Thessalonians 5.16 Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, give thanks. Thursday, we're all going to be gathered around that bird. Many households will go around and ask each other what they have to be thankful for Come up with some real good things. But I got news for you. This isn't just a holiday tr tradition. We should be doing this basically every day of our lives. Prayer isn't just asking God for stuff. Prayer should also be spending some time just thanking Him for stuff. Yeah, you know. Take some time out. Don't ask God for nothing. Just go down the road thanking Him for all the things you can think of to be thankful for. Mm -hmm. That's the way it should be. Truth be known, when you consider how much God has done for us, how many blessings He sent our way, we should take our time to count our blessings and name them one by one. Spend some time in nothing but thanksgiving. Nine of the lepers take off a running and never look back. Only one turns back to give praise, honor, and glory to God. Why? Why didn't the other lepers turn back? Why didn't they thank God? We don't know the answer to those questions. Because we don't know what they were thinking, but I'd like to give you a couple of possibilities as to why they didn't turn back to thank God. And it also might explain why folks act the way they do today when it comes to thanking God. Number one, 
Those who are forgiven much often love much. That might be the root of this whole situation. Those who are forgiven much also love much. Earlier I mentioned the story of the harlot who showed up at Simon the leper's house and proceeded to anoint Jesus with an expensive ointment and wash, her, wash his feet with her tears. Jesus told Simon the leper, I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she hath loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Wow, what about that? It's very possible that this Samaritan had lived a very wicked life and had just about lost all hope of deliverance. But then he found hope in Jesus. I'll just say this. Many of you grew up in the church singing Sunday school songs, youth group, kids club, and all those things from the time you were knee high to a buck. You've just been in church your whole life. And you love it because you wouldn't be here today if you didn't. But, but it's just been my observation that those that have gotten saved out of the world, I got saved as a young adult out of a life of wickedness. It just seems to me that when you come out of that kind of darkness, it just seems like your appreciation for God is so much greater because you knew who you used to be and you knew what you used to do. But if you've grown up basically a, a church kid, maybe you never really got that far away from God and praise God for that because there's no telling how many years the locust has taken from me before I finally came to know God. So there may be something to that. You talk to stories about folks that have gotten saved in jail, folks that have gotten saved in mental wards, folks that were in a near-death experience where they almost died, and they come out of that thing and change a person because they know how close they came to die, to losing it, all hope. So maybe there is something to that. I think that passage, to whom much is given, much is required. So it's something to think about that, that maybe that's what it is. That if you've lost a lot, if you've been through a lot, when God gives you that second chance at life, you just seem to have a greater appreciation yes. for the things of God. Yes. Secondly, it's very possible that this Samaritan was the only one that ever got truly saved. I mean, that's a possibility also. In the story of the ten lepers, there's no mention that any of them became believers or disciples or followers of Christ. We are only told that they were healed. But the one who turned back gives a clear indication that his life had been changed and that he was no longer the same person. I mean, look what Jesus says here. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, he had already been healed. So I don't think Jesus was talking about a physical change. I believe Jesus was talking about the physical change. The spiritual transformation that took place the moment he got saved by faith. Why would he add that? Thy faith hath made thee whole. Jesus said the same thing when those fellas carried that guy on his cot, couldn't get near the house, so they tore a hole in the roof, lowered him down here, and it says their faith hath made thee whole. Talking about salvation, not the physical healing. Those, those nine lepers were physically healed. But I got news for you. If they didn't get their hearts right with God, it would be only a matter of time before sin creeped back into their lives and they started going down them dark paths again and their health would be physically wrecked again. Maybe not with leprosy, but with some other disease that's out there. Earlier I mentioned that there are a few things necessary for someone to get saved. Number one, you must be drawn to God. He's not going to save you against your will. You've got to be drawn to God. Number two, you have to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. It's not enough to have it knowledge. Salvation comes from the heart. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thirdly, you must call upon him. That's praying and asking him to save your soul. There is one other thing that's required for someone to be saved, and that is the need for repentance. You don't hear a lot of folks talking about repentance nowadays. And that's a problem right there because when Jesus and John the Baptist came on the scene, they came preaching a message of repentance. It's not enough just to pray a prayer. I can hold a gun to your head and say, pray this prayer. I can give you a hundred dollar bill and say, pray this prayer. But it won't be the thing if there's no repentance. That's the problem. Repentance is this. Your life has been going in one direction, but now you've turned your life around and you're going God's way. That's what repentance is. 
You've turned your life around to go God's way. The moment that leper turned back to the Son of God, he was heading in the right direction. Amen? Amen. Here's what many don't realize. Those nine lepers, they never turned back. And it reminds me of folks that want God to help them with their problems or they want God to get them out of a bad situation and they'll cry out to God for help. But they have no interest in living for God. Right. All they're interested in is, what can you do for me, Lord? We get, we'll get phone calls. They're already starting. Can you help us out with Christmas? Never once asking us, oh, by the way, what time's church service? Or I'm looking for a good church preacher. If you can help me out, that's good. But I'm looking for a good church. It's always, we need Christmas present. We need this and that. We need that. But no interest in spiritual matters. And I'm not fussing about it. But I'm just saying we've got to have our priorities right. There's a difference between regret and repentance. Many regret bad decisions that they've made. They regret the consequences of their bad decisions. Jail, divorce, loss of a job, financial ruin. They regret how things turned out. But they never repented of their sin. And there's a big difference. There's a lot of folks locked up. And they regret getting locked up. But if they've never repented, then they've learned nothing. 2 Corinthians 7.10 declares, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. That's it. A third possible reason why the nine never turned back, they didn't want to waste any time getting back to their lives as sin. Boy, that, that speaks volumes of what we're seeing today. They didn't turn back because they didn't want to get waste any time getting back to their old lives of sin. The prison system released inmates believed to be re rehabilitated and then many are no sooner released before they return to their lives of crime. I told you that story about that guy from Motley Crue. He OD was actually clinically declared dead for like two minutes. They gave him that medicine that jump starts his heart. The guy jumped up like somebody had scared him opened up the back of that van and went back to his house and got high again. I mean, how do you explain something like that? He was clinically dead and was left in about a man. They thought I was a guard. They gave me something, jump-started me, and he went right back to doing what he was doing. You know, the Bible talks about dogs returning to their vomit, pigs returning to their mud. And if we don't give our lives to God, that's exactly what it's talking about there. Guy loses his license for something and then goes right back to the wicked life they were living. We shake our heads at those kind of situations and say, what's wrong with these people? How could they go back after be, being given a second chance at life? How could they go back uh, after going through that? Why didn't they learn their lessons? And the answer is because they haven't hit rock bottom yet. As messed up as their lives appear, they're still not ready to surrender their lives and go God's way. I mean, why else would the story of the prodigal son be in there? We can stand back and look at his life and say, man, he should have gotten right with God a long time before he hit rock bottom. Ideally, yes. And that holds true for every one of us. But unfortunately, sometimes it's only when you're flat on your back that you're looking up and realizing, you know, maybe there's a better way. Maybe it's time to go God's way. The prodigal son hit rock bottom, and it had to be that way because we are told only then did he come to his senses and return to the Father. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way, but for so many of us, that's how it is. As long as we can get out of a jam, weasel our way out of some situation, that's the course we're going to take. But sometimes God will put us in situations where our back is up against the wall, and there ain't no way to weasel our way out of a situation. We got no choice but to fall to the ground and cry out to God. And only then can God help us. Yes. Something to think about. It's possible those nine lepers were simply living for the day when they could get back to life in the fast lane and pick up where they left off. I can just see them running along. Boy, I can't wait to get a cold one at I have to bar. I hope they save my bar stool. I'm going to sit right in that same spot and I'm going to order one of everything they got there. Boy, I hope they didn't close down that crack house in Camden. I got some of the best stuff I ever got there. That's where I'm headed. Where are you headed? Oh, I'm going to go across town. I got a connection over there. 
going right back to their old lives. One last possible reason as to why the nine lepers didn't turn back. Number four, maybe they were running from God. Those nine lepers were Jews, which means they knew God's word, and there's no doubt that they knew a miracle had just taken place in their supernatural healing. Also, they knew Jesus' name, and in calling upon him to heal them, it means they understood who he claimed to be, the promised Messiah. Now, if they knew all those things, the only possible reason why they didn't turn back is that they were running from God. There are folks that grew up in church, kids club, youth group, Sunday school. They know all the hymns, all the Bible stories. But when they grew up, they got away from God. And they've been running from God ever since. Others are mad at God, bitter at God, shaking their fist at God over something that happened in their life. And like the nine lepers, they've been running from God ever since. Some are like the prodigal son, maybe lived for God for several years, were active in church, but the devil put it in their minds that the grass was greener out there in the world, that the Christian life was boring, that the world had something better to offer than what God had to offer, and they drifted farther and farther away from the Christian life they once lived. Some are like Jonah. God's called them. He's got a plan for their life. And like Jonah, he went the complete opposite direction because he had no desire to do what God had called him to do. And many are like that. You have gifts and skills and talents that God wants you to use for His glory. But that means commitment. That means being involved. That means more than being just a Sunday morning Christian. It means sacrifice, effort, sweat, blood. And many aren't willing to pay that price. A fellow one time wanted to get involved in church and was given a position and he said, uh, if I knew it was going to be this much work, I wouldn't have volunteered for it. Uh. So they run from God. Listen, it's never too late to rededicate your life to God, to turn your life around and get back on, on God's path. Here's the thing. You can run from God for only so long, but you can't hide from God. Joe Lewis said, said it. You can run, but you can't hide. He's telling it right. You can run from God. Jonah tried. He tried to put some distance between him and God. But he'll only let you run so far and for so long before God says, enough's enough. In the story of the ten lepers, those lepers had a decision to make. They could either turn back or keep running from God. Nine of them started running and never looked back. But what about that one leper that turned back? What can we learn from it? I'll close with this. Number one, the first thing we can learn from that leper that turned back is, it's never too late to turn back to God. As long as you're living and breathing, there's hope that you can get turned around. Now, it probably isn't necessarily good to wait till you got one foot out the door. Yeah, it's good to, to leave this world right with God. But how much opportunities are you missing? The indication is that Solomon squandered much of his life searching for the meaning of life. And as an old man, he got his heart right with God. Well, praise God for that, but how much more could he have done if he would have made that decision while he could still have an effect? There's coming a day we won't be able to get around like we, like we used to. It's now that God wants to use you. Now while you're still able to be used. In verse 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back. This fellow was in bad shape, had probably lost all hope, but then he heard about Jesus. Sometimes we hit rock bottom, and it's then that we turn back to God. I think of the demoniac of the Gadarenes. Here's a guy that had 6,000 demons in him. But then he got saved. And we're told that he was clothed and in his right mind. This leper was in bad shape. But he was given a second chance at life. And if God's the only one that's going to do that. The world sometimes will never forgive what you may have done wrong. But God's willing to forgive it and forgive it. Forget it and give you a fresh start and a new beginning in life. I mean, you can't beat that kind of offer. That fellow made a decision. He made a determination that his running days were over, and he was ready to turn back to God. Friends, all of us here today have made bad mistakes, decisions we regret, and we can just spend our days just wallowing in it. Oh, I should have done this. I could have done that. I, I didn't do this. You've got to leave the past in the past and get on with your life. Because the devil, the accuser of the brethren, he's going to be right there throwing it back in your face. 
And you've got to put it behind you and get turned around God's way. There's a second thing we can learn from that leper. And it's the fact that we need to give God the glory. Not just when he answers our prayers or pours us out of blessing, but in all things we need to give God glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Whether therefore you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And then 1 Peter 4.11 That God in all things may be glorified. That's what he wants from us. To glorify him. Our lives are no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. We now belong to God. So glorify Him with your lives. What does it mean to glorify God? Appreciate Him. Adore Him. Have affection for Him. And then be in subjection to Him. Not my will, but Thy will be done, Lord. And we see all those things in this leper. Notice also that he glorified God with a loud voice. When you take time to realize just how much we have to be thankful for, it'll make you want to shout. It'll make you want to shout. Sometimes I'll start thinking about what God's done for me, where he's brought me from. I just got to let her out. I got to air it out. When God works some mighty miracle in your life, it's not a time for quiet reflection. It's not a time for soft and gentle words of thanks. There's a time and a place for that. But there are also times... When God wants you to lift up your voice and get to shout. You've been tormented by devils, being oppressed by devils. Folks will come to me and say, I, I think i got devils in my house. Maybe so. Maybe there's something in your house that's drawing them. I just say, listen, crank up some good Christian music, some praise and worship music, and get her shouting. Them devils got to run. They can't stand praise to the Lord. So that's what you need to do. And I'll just tell you this, I'm no doctor. But there's times you just gotta, you can't let that, that, all that praise and joy get bottled up. Top of your head might explode. Like when them cowboys score a touchdown against the Eagles. I don't just sit there saying, bravo, bravo, carry on. I'll get up out of my chair and just say, yeah! Gotta let her out. That's it. And it's the same way it comes to worshiping the Lord. You gotta let her out. You might get heartburn or something like that if you don't let her out there. So, so take some time to shout. My nose just took off. <laughs> there is one last thing we can learn from that level. Take time to thank the Lord. Verse 16. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Now he could have just turned around from over his shoulder and said, Thanks a lot, Lord. Have a good day. Peace be with you. He could have just looked over his shoulder or even just turned around and gave him a thumbs up and said, thanks a lot, Lord. I'll be on my way now. That still would have been a whole lot more than what those other lepers did. They never even said thanks. So he could even justify it saying, well, you know what? At least I said thank you. But he didn't do that. Instead, he took his time about it. Didn't rush his time of thanksgiving. In fact, we were told that he fell on, on his face at the feet of Jesus. Which tells me this. He wasn't planning on going nowhere for any time soon. If you fall down on, your, on the ground, you're planning on being there for a while. And this is important. When Jesus came to the home of Mary and Martha, Mary, uh, Martha was rushing about and she was covered about much certain. She was stressed out, and got kind of rude to Jesus about it, and then started getting on her sister. Jesus said, Mary's chosen the good thing, and she'll be forever remembered about it. What did she do? She was sitting at the feet of Jesus. This was the last time Jesus would be in their home, and she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, soaking it all up. <coughs> and we're told the same thing about the demoniac of the gatherings. When he got saved, he was clothed, and in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. <coughs> That's significant. It means you're not in a hurry. You're not rushed in your worship of the Lord. <coughs> What I'm trying to say is the best way to show your thanks to God is by spending time with Him and not being in any hurry to go your own <coughs> way. If you've ever been in the military, you know, you see soldiers, they pray real fast. I knew some friends that were in the Marines, they'd say, Phew. before they even said that last amen, they had two gulps of food in their mouth. Wow, that's some quick praying. And if you've ever been to Thanksgiving gatherings, sometimes you smell that bird and you just want to say, thank you, Lord, Jesus, thank you. But the reality of the matter is, we shouldn't be rushed when it comes to worshiping the Lord and praising Him. 
Take some time. Like that song says, take time to be holy. But take time to thank God also. Because we got so much to be thankful for. And I think it bothers God when he sees us rushed. If Jesus made a statement about them nine lepers being rushed in what they were doing, i got to believe that he does the same thing with us. Yeah. That if we just pray and ask him for stuff all the time and, and maybe give him a quick, thanks Lord, see you later. That it's got to bother him to some degree. So if you can remember anything this Thanksgiving, this year's winding down, maybe it's a good time to, to, to jumpstart your prayer life. Beginning with Thanksgiving. Thank you and praise him. Spending more time worshiping. Why don't we all stand? Now with heads bowed and eyes closed.